for being here. I'm Anna Gaffin Hines. I'm a faculty member here in the Sanford School. I'm a faculty affiliate of the Center for Telling Family Policy. Um, we're so glad you're here today. Today's lecture is part of the Center for Child and Family Policy's really childhood initiative, um, which seeks to bring together scholars to address challenges that produce world class scholarship that helps maximize the potential of all children, especially during the early childhood years. Speakers in the series range across disciplines, but share interest in bringing cutting edge science to bear on policy and effects on children. Here, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, as part of this series, it is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Claire Dukin Walk, who is today's um, featured speaker. Dr. Dukin Walk is an assistant professor in the Department of Economics at the University of Pittsburgh. She is an applied microeconomist working at the intersection of labor, development, and behavioral economics. Recent work explores the cognitive impact of poverty on kids of sleep, seasonality in rural labor markets, and the impact of child youth. Her research has appeared in academic journals, including the American Economic Review, the Journal of Environmental Economic Management, and Food Policy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dukin. Uh, thank you all for, for being here and for inviting me. It's been a wonderful day. I really enjoyed meeting uh, everyone who I've spoken to. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my co author, Joan Manzel, who's one of my PhD students and will be joining the University of Guelph in uh, Canada next year. So, uh, enjoy work with her. Um, and so, in this project, um, we're going to be looking at. So, this is to be clear, this is actually the first of a number of papers that we're hoping to write looking at uh, child media or media representation in general. The child media um, is it, one of the, the things that I'm focusing on. And so, in this particular paper, we're going to be looking at uh, Sesame Street specifically and impact on, on the And so, um, I imagine most of you are familiar with uh, Sesame Street, but uh, for those of you who aren't, Sesame Street was a childhood show, an early childhood kind of educational TV show that started airing in November 1969. Um, and it's a show that really became very successful in its on the very first season. Um, it's estimated that you know within the first season, essentially, it was achieving ratings. Where about half of the preschoolers who had access to the show were able to pick up a TV signal for the show were actually watching. And so it really kind of uh, became extremely successful very, very fast. And um, the show was pretty unusual. Um, it featured an um, academic curriculum as well as kind of these social emotional um, uh, curriculums also. That uh, really targeted these preschool age kids. So you should be taking the kids ages two to five, which kind of the original uh, age group that Sesame Street targeted in its early um, years. And what we're what we are going to be particularly interested in is the fact that um, even from the very first season, the cast was exceptionally diverse and integrated. And so even from season one, um, the, the show had, well, obviously the Muppets, right, which we all immediately associate with Sesame Street, very diverse group of Muppets. <laughs> but um, in addition to the diverse group of Muppets, they had these reoccurring adult role model type characters that uh, the, the original cast was the cast that we're here featuring uh, two white men. And then an African American man and an African American woman. And in addition to these adult uh, role model type characters, you also had this very diverse group of integrated children who you've ever seen the show, where they're just always running around, interacting with the Muppets and the, and the adults and stuff. So. Um, and all of the interactions that happen on this show are extremely friendly, egalitarian, respectful, just a wonderful kind of environment that's prepared. Um, also, the, the female characters all had jobs. Right? Um, and so, in the first season, uh, this cast, within a couple seasons, the cast was expanded to include expanded characters as well. Um, and so, just a very kind of diverse group of uh, cast members from the early seasons and the early seasons. Um, and this is pretty unusual, right? You think about the television context at the time, this was quite novel. Um, 
And this cat was absolutely loved by this audience. Right? So obviously the kids love the Muppets, but they also love uh, the adult characters too. So this is a quote um, taken from uh, Loretta Long, who's describing here a trip that the cats took to Jackson, Mississippi, um, I think in 1970. And she said, little white kids would reach out and kiss me or form as the other black character. And you can see their mothers were amused. But they loosened up because how can you take someone who makes your child so happy? Right? And so there's this idea that you know these characters are creating these sort of strong bonds through television to their audience, um, and bonds that perhaps uh, did not exist um, in, in previous early childhood films. Okay. Similarly, um, this is uh, Emilio Delgado, who played Greece on Sesame Street uh, for many, many uh, decades. Um, and when he passed away a couple years, a few years back, um, Twitter kind of filled up with memorial comments, often expressing this idea that for a lot of the audience, he was kind of the first Hispanic person they ever felt they got to know. Right? So um, uh, Luis Rodriguez was the first Hispanic man I ever got to know. Right? Um, uh, for us who are not, let's like, live in cultural and linguistically diverse communities, one of the first Hispanic Americans we ever met, right? And so this idea that he was providing insight to this large audience, to a community that was perhaps not uh, visible to a lot of uh, American kids. So the question that we're, we're looking at in this particular project is whether or not um, there's any evidence that child media um, can help reduce prejudice in the long run. And we're going to be focusing in this particular project on the impacts on voter preferences um, and behaviors that can have. So thinking about whether exposure to this more diverse um, set of cast members and forming these kind of bonds through television with uh, this cast um, has long run impacts on, on adult behaviors. So we're going to be speaking to a couple of different literatures. Now, to be clear, as an applied economist, um, this is a very applied economics paper. And so we're going to be really trying to focus on uh, identifying these possible impacts uh, through, through uh, the mechanisms that we're going to be looking at. Um, and so the literature that I'm going to be covering is really kind of other work that has identified kind of possible impacts uh, using this approach. And so, um, in economics, um, there has been work that has kind of looked at the mass media and shown that the mass media can causally impact a number of important outcomes, things like savings, consumption, crime, health, and Washington. So there's a fairly wide literature that has looked at kind of causal effects of the mass media on important outcomes. And a lot of uh, work has actually been done looking at how the media can impact have causal impacts on, on voting and political preferences. Okay. However, much of the work that we know about for this kind of causal impact of the media on voting has primarily focused on kind of adult content media, oftentimes news media, and looking at kind of relatively rapid short run outcomes. So exposure to the news and then maybe six months later, how do we recover? Um, we don't really know much about how child media could impact a later life voting. There's also a number of different papers um, and kind of cognitive side evidence that shows that uh, uh, mass media can aggravate racial and ethnic tensions, uh, increase in group bias and in prejudice. Um, looking at, again, oftentimes looking at news and social media, um, those types of what there hasn't been a lot of evidence on is whether or not, uh, at least positive identified evidence, is looking at the impacts of how the media could actually act to reduce this kind of bias. Um, and so there's some interesting papers about a soap opera, um, a radio soap opera in Rwanda um, uh, that was shown to reduce kind of interethnic tensions um, in that context. And I just thought I would love to. And a very recent paper looking at uh, the Superman radio show in the US and kind of impacts on the press voting. And so, and then of course, there's also uh, evidence that the media can impact kids, but much of that work is really focused on educational impacts and impacts on, on human capital. 
Um, and so there's actually quite a lot of research that has looked at the impacts of the Sesame Street, often in hand with this kind of uh, looking at educational impacts. Um, and in particular, we very relevant to what I'm going to be doing in this two year looking uh, 2019 paper. I'm going to be using essentially the same approach that they're using um, to, to look at the outcomes from the data examine. And so, in this particular paper, they essentially are able to show that um, Sesame Street uh, improved grade for age um, for kids throughout elementary school. And so, kids were more likely to be in the grade that was appropriate for their age um, in, in elementary school years. Um, but uh, in the long run, you don't really see any impacts on uh, overall educational attainment or income. Right. So that's what they find in their paper. We're actually going to replicate those results in our data. So a different set of data with the same patterns. Right. Um, but so so we do know that Sesame Street had uh, kind of clearly had impacts on kind of educational outcomes. There's also a little bit of evidence um, that it improved uh, pro-social behaviors. And so uh, there's some early work. Sesame Street was an extremely well-researched show. Um, they did impact evaluations and there were a lot of assessments of how the show was doing. So there is some early evidence that it impacted uh, certain kind of non-academic outcomes such as social behavior. And there's a, a few papers that look at um, other shows produced by the Children's Television Workshop, so in an in international context, because they produce Sesame Street-like shows in, in other places. Um, and so there is some paper looking at, again, uh, children's television workshop data and, and showing some evidence uh, in the short run that it may have produced kind of racial biases using data from a show in jail and Palestine that was kind of similar to the Sesame Um But uh, what we do know here is all very short run effects. And so kids watching the show, and then a few weeks later or within a few months, Kind of answering questions. And so, what we really don't have is any kind of long run uh, estimates of impacts on whether it really had long run impacts on, on its audience in terms of this, uh, impacts on um, racial biases. <laughs> the project is also speaking to uh, some work on um, is it possible for me to move this again? Probably so we can hide it. Hide it. Yeah, right there. Yep. And then hide so they may need to roll. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, and so then um, it's also going to speak to the literature that's looking at kind of representation, interactions, and prejudice. And so there's a literature that is kind of role model type of literature that has looked at how exposure to um, minority role models. Typically focusing on outcomes of the minority, right? And so a lot of literature is looking at kind of that match. Um, what we don't know as much of and has not been the focus so much is how kind of role models and positions of leadership really affects prejudice for the ages of the majority group. Um, and then I think this particular uh, project. We're really thinking of it in the framework kind of of the contact theory literature. And so that's a literature that kind of speaks to this idea that uh, interacting with uh, other groups on a more equal and cooperative kind of interpersonal contact can help to reduce prejudice. And so there's a number of papers that have looked at this um, in policy identified ways, oftentimes using. <clears throat> Uh, contact in college years through like the random assignments of roommates in college, right? And then impacts, you know, at the end of the term or something like that. Um, in terms of earlier years, uh, younger, younger uh, uh, exposure, um, there's a set of papers that's starting to come out uh, that's been finding effects in the long run of increased interaction for school age kids. And so you think kind of, if you happen to be in a particular year in your school where you had more classmates that weren't in the majority, right? How does that affect you? Um, and then, uh, so, so there's some, starting to be some kind of recent evidence for these kind of impacts uh, in, in school age kids. 
And then there's also some kind of experimental work, right? Uh, there's like experimental kind of context where people use interaction with the people in this message from that literature as well. Um, what we don't know so much is that whether or not this kind of increased interaction or contact could also happen through the media. And so it's a different kind of context, it's a long way context, but you can imagine uh, kind of something similar happening. And yeah, I think that this is important um, because, well, A, if you pay attention to popular discourse or politics, people talk about media representation all the time. Um, and particularly, uh, media representation in the context of children's media is commonly discussed, I and mean, it's not something that we have a ton of evidence on. Um, and then what little evidence we have um, really does suggest that you know certain types of media can uh, help to reduce kind of bias and prejudice. Uh, so, so the evidence that we have is quite promising. Um, and then importantly, I think in terms of thinking about interventions. Um, and policy, you know, the kinds of interventions that people have discussed or considered in terms of reducing bias and increasing kind of uh, uh, reducing interactive tensions and uh, those can be extremely pretty hands on and you can imagine fairly different scale, but technology, the technology involved with mass media, unless the show is produced, is on a very low marginal cost. And so there's a scalability to this type of uh, intervention that uh, is not necessarily as easily imaginable for other things that people expect. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about Sesame Street and the background of the show. Um, and then I'm going to discuss kind of how we go about uh, getting at causal effects. Uh, I'll talk about the data that we're working with and then dive into the results. So in terms of the background, uh, so like I said, the show first aired in November 1969. It was very successful um, from the get-go, pretty much. Um, it's considered to be the brainchild of the experimental psychologist, Dr. Lloyd Morissette, and the television producer, John Gans Um And so what they were interested in doing is they wanted to basically see whether the hypnotic power of TV on small children can be put to educational purposes. Um, and so it was a very well, like when you start reading the documentation, it was a very well researched show. There was a lot of thought that was put into the design of the show. Um, they sought a lot of input from both experts as well as practitioners in a variety of different fields, including uh, education, child development, psychology, and the arts. Um, I think it's telling, for instance, that they brought on Dr. Chester Pierce, who was like an expert psychiatrist, who was brought on as a senior advisor, and he was an expert on the consequences of racism and the effects of television portrayals of mind workers. Right? So he was very active in designing the show. And the show, like I said, it features this educational content, which has been the focus of a lot of um, research. Uh, but in addition to a very explicit academic curriculum, people often describe Sesame Street as having a, a hidden curriculum, which um, included goals such as improving children's self image, racial tolerance, racial tolerance uh, recognizing this as perspective, cooperation, and fairness. Um, the hidden curriculum was not as explicit in that, and for funding reasons, they wanted to have a set of rules that they could really test right, with their impact evaluations. And so those were typically the academic goals and the hidden curriculum was, uh, was there in the background but wasn't necessarily explicitly outlined um, that they were kind of going to funding. Um, the show explicitly sought to appeal to non-white, non-suburban kids. Um, and so you can, if you think about the setting of Sesame Street, right, so even just the setting was chosen to be reminiscent of an urban uh, African American neighborhood. So the architecture is reminiscent of part of the brownstones. It was deliberately decided to make this, this, the show not look like pristine. And so there's garbage cans, there's a TV, right? It's supposed to be reminiscent of a neighborhood that, that uh, kids might, might recognize. Um, and uh, the cast was exceptionally diverse and integrated, so obviously there's these 
at a role model care camp that we talked about, um, all the women had jobs. Um, they had a very diverse group of women who kids all the time. They also had quite a few uh, guest stars, a lot of uh, diversity in the guest star list as well. Oftentimes, in the early season, people that were involved in the civil rights movement. Um, and obviously, everybody is super friendly. So this was quite unusual for the time, and I think it's something that it did face backlash, right? So like Mississippi tried to veto the airing of Sesame Street in 1970 because of how diverse the show was. Um, it was reinstated because parents actually wanted to have access to the show, so it didn't take, but there was backlash right? how the show was. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the appearance and how we uh, kind of disentangle stuff in order to get a causal effect. Um, and so we're essentially going to be using uh, what's called the difference in difference design. And so the idea is we're going to think of each observation in our data kind of falling into one of four categories. Now. I'm actually going to have a continual stretch from Sesame Street coverage, but in order to understand what I'm doing, it's easy to just kind of imagine like a low Sesame Street coverage county, which is a high Sesame Street coverage. So we're going to take the counties and essentially have a measure of how easy was it for people in that county in 1969 to pick up the Sesame Street signal. Right. And to be clear, this is exactly the same strategy that Kenny and Levine used in their paper. Uh, we're actually kind of tying our hands to what they did, right, and show that you know, that approach is working for us as well in terms of when it's time. Um, and so we have a measure of the coverage rate uh, that different counties had for Sesame Street in 1969. And so we can imagine, okay, we're going to compare places that have low coverage versus places that have high uh, Sesame Street coverage. And then Essentially, if we think about the low Sesame Street coverage area, we're going to be focusing on people who were somewhere close to the age of six um, in 1969. And so we're going to divide our sample essentially into two groups. There are going to be this group up here, which is people who are born 1959 to 1963. These are people who would have been older than six in 1969. And so a, they're not going to be in the targeted age group for the show, which was really designed for two to five year olds, right? And B, they would have been in school. And so they would have had less time to watch the show regularly, uh, in addition to not being kind of deprived of a traffic rush. We're also going to have people who are younger than six in 1969. And so these are people born in 1964 to 1968. These are going to be uh, in places where Sesame Street coverage is low, where right? these are places where preschool age when Sesame Street started airing but didn't have access to the What the low Sesame Street coverage group is doing, uh, everybody in places that are in a low coverage area, they're going to allow us to identify and kind of figure out general patterns that were common to everybody born in that cohort. Right? So using this untreated low coverage area, we can figure out in a state for a particular cohort, how did people vote in general? Right? And that's going to give us essentially a good control against whom we can compare the behavior of people in this high coverage area. And so, in the high Sesame Street coverage area, the older cohorts are still going to think of them as untreated because they would have been in school and they have the primary demographic. And we're going to compare their voting patterns to these individuals here. Or going to be who we think of as, as treated. And so these are kids who were preschool age, because preschool at the time was not common, right? So when I say preschool age, I mean not actually in preschool, but somewhere between two and five. Uh, they might have been in kindergarten, but kindergarten was in a half day, right? So these are kids who were likely at home um, and had a lot more opportunity to watch the show on top of being the demographic of the show was really targeted, right? Um, and so essentially what we're going to be doing with this strategy is we're going to be comparing how do these kids, people vote compared to kids who are slightly older than them once I control for the general patterns that pertain to those 
will cohort us with that. So, for the technically inclined, <laughs> this is the inclined metrics. Um, all the coefficients that I'm going to be presenting are the, the beta 1 coefficients here. I'm going to scale them for interpretation. Um, but essentially, we're going to be looking at, you know, if you are the right age group based on the coverage rates in your county, um, and how does that affect your outcome? And we're going to be controlling for two important fixed effects. So the first is just state by cohort by election year. So this is kind of controlling for people who are the same age in the same state in general, how do they vote, right? And then this county by congressional district by election year. So people in your county who are voting on the same ballot, how do those people on that? So there's a couple issues that we have to keep in mind um, and say worry, but think about. Um, the data that we're looking at is going to be data for adults in the 2000s, typically. And so this is quite a good chunk of time post-1969. Um, and so there are a couple of concerns because typically in the, in the data, we only know where you live now. We don't necessarily know where you live when you were six. Right? So, um, we are worried about selective migration. So you would be concerned if exposure to the show increased or changed in some way the likelihood that you remain in your current in your childhood county. Okay. So we can actually check for that. We do a number of tests. We find no evidence that exposure to the show changes the probability that you still report residing in the same city um, uh, as where you were when you were two. Um, we also don't see any impact on the likelihood that you uh, move across states in the American Community Survey. So we, we don't think that this is a, a big issue for us. Uh, and we're working to get some better data to really test the set of capital. The other issue is what we call attenuation bias. So if two few respondents are still living in their childhood county, you would not pick up a fax. Well, A, you pick up effects, so this doesn't seem to be a huge problem for us. It's true that a large share of people in the U.S. do move away from their childhood county. So right now we can figure that that number is over the 291 to 49%. We're getting better data so we can uh, uh, figure out exactly the inter-county migration rates. Um, but what you do see in kind of general migration data for the U.S. is a lot of people when they move away from their childhood county are just moving one county over. And the coverage rates of the neighboring counties are very similar. So even if we're not assigning you exactly the right coverage rate, we're going to get pretty close right? um, for, for most of you. Okay. Next up. Yeah. Do you mind taking questions during? Um, during I'm sorry. Right. I don't know what the format is, but that's we, we follow you. So you tell okay. us. Okay. Um, sure. That's fine. So can you tell us just a little bit more about what drove television access? County by county yes. at this time. So I'll, give it, oh. I'll be there when I present the data. I'll tell you a little bit more about yeah. that. Um, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with the other data yeah, because first and I'll get to the yeah. average in a second. Um, uh, the first big data set that we're going to be working with, so these are the outcomes that we're going to be looking at. So the first big data, data set that we're going to be working with is the, the Cooperative Congressional Election Study. This is the CCS data for short. Um, we're going to be using responses from the year. So the a survey that's conducted initially every year. We're going to be using election year responses specifically for elections between 2006 and 2020. Um, and it's a survey that basically asks people about their political behavior, some views on policies, public opinion, and so forth. Right? Um, interestingly and importantly, in addition to kind of self-reported stuff, they actually do validate some of their data. So they validate turnout uh, against kind of uh, broad, you know, they can actually, they have a commercial company that identifies whether or not somebody is actually doing this right? um, And they also check registration data, so the registration data is also validated against kind of, uh, uh, active to check and see whether people truly do have active registration. So my main sample of this data set is going to be non-immigrant citizens born between 1969 and 1968. And we're going to focus on people who report voting on a major, what I call a major party ballot for the U.S. House of Representatives. 
And so we define major party ballots as ballots that feature a Democrat running against a Republican, where both of those candidates receive at least five percent of the vote. So that's the vast majority of these elections in the U.S. context. We're doing this mostly for clarity and expositional purposes, so that we can really kind of compare these types of elections without thinking about the complexity of what's happening when there's a single person running unopposed to Democrats and Indians. This ends up being like 87 percent of the ballots. In addition to that, we're also going to have data on implicit association test score. And so this is data that's coming from Project Implicit, which is a website that's out of Harvard. Um, implicit association tests, some of you may be familiar with them. They're tests that are designed by psychologists that try and get at this measure of implicit bias. Right? And so essentially what an implicit association test does is it's going to the test takers will see a series of images and words on their screen and be asked to sort down as fast as possible into two bits. And so if you're taking the racial implicit association test, you would see a sequence of images of people of different races and then terms that are either positive or negative. And then you have to sort them. And sometimes it could be that you have to sort uh, white images with negative terms, or it could be that you have to sort black images with negative terms. And how fast you can do the different sorting exercises is uh, attributed to uh, some implicit uh, bias. And so the idea being it's harder to sort if you're grouping images and words that you don't associate with each other. You're going to struggle with that. Yeah. But so at the media market level, well, I, possibly, I think so. I'm going to be using the Kieran and the media, which is at the county level. So it's actually media market. Also, like, yeah, media market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that we could. Um, yeah, we could do that. I think, uh, and I don't know that. So we're going to actually going to have county 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 migration, but we're going to actually soon be able to see exactly whether or not there's any impact on the county migration. Like the data is being like, <laughs> but, uh, but is there, we're going to be able to really get exactly at whether or not there's like an effect on injury. But my guess is no, because we don't see any effect on intercity moving, and we don't see any effect on interstate moving. So I don't think it's it's pushing people to, to make these big big move decisions. So the IAP data, so the IAP data is with this test, and essentially what Harvard's done is for many years now, every couple of decades, they've made available these IAP tests online. Anybody can log in and take an IAP test. And so you complete a survey, you answer a few questions, um, which we're also going to look at some of the survey responses and then take this IAP test. And there's several different types of IAP tests. There's um, uh, race IAP, but also gender and career IAP tests. Um, and so our sample of the IAP data is going to be U.S. resident citizens, again, born between 1950 and 1960. So here's the Sesame Street coverage data, uh, which I think we'll get a little bit. So this data is actually the data that was compiled by Kieran and Levine uh, for the 2019 paper. I'm taking the data that they put together. And essentially what they do in order to generate this data is they um, they figure out for, uh, they have information on the exact technical specifications of all the different broadcasting powers in the United States. And using uh, coverage rates for different TV channels, they're able to figure out kind of, depending on the characteristics of the broadcasting power, how likely is it that you get coverage in particular towns. And so then they take that, the relationship between the technical and the coverage and apply it specifically to the powers that were broadcast at Sesame Street and to get a prediction of how likely is it that you're going to be able to pick up uh, a Sesame Street signal based on the current today. Okay. Uh, I can go into more detail, but um, basically we're taking their data kind of off the shelf uh, and, and I give them full credit for coming up with 
this is not his uh, approach. Um, okay, the last piece of data, which surprisingly was the hardest to collect, you would think that was pretty good, uh, is with the compilation of the actual demographic characteristics to these major party candidates for these years have seen. And so um, we're going to be looking at, again at people who are uh, voting on this major party ballot. So that is about 87% of all ballots in the US with this time period. And we essentially compile basic demographic characteristics of the two major party candidates, so the, the, the Democrat and the Republican um, And we can then kind of categorize the different kinds of ballots that people are facing in their district. Um, a lot of ballots are, you know, two white men running against each other, right? Um, but then you also have a fair amount of variation of other types of ballots that you might be uh, facing uh, in the election. <laughs> okay, so moving on to results. So I'm going to show you. Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> So what's the, the theory is, I understand the, the racially diverse part of some history, mm -hmm. but the theory in terms of electoral participation, yeah. can you just say a little, is, is, and is that going to vary, can you just say a little bit more about what that, what that connection might be? So we do find impact on participation. Um, we think that, so what, when we get into the, we find some evidence that people just seem to be a little bit more engaged, um, and it seems to be marginal workers that are a little bit more engaged. Now, it could be educational effects that are trickling into participation. So even though it might not affect education in the long run, there is evidence that still affected kind of the process of education. So you might have gotten more of the years in between schooling and that could be what you want. We don't find that the turnout effects differ widely based on the ballot character. So it, it, it just seems to be kind of underlying all the voting patterns. Well, <laughs> and if you have any insights, I would love to hear. Um, well, so, I, just, I just wondered if you would feel more hopeful about. I mean, I don't know. Like you just felt more hopeful about the world if you if you were schooled in a world that like where people yeah. were nice and respectful. Yeah. Maybe you just have more sort of hope about the world and more trust in this. It should be, right? And so there is like a lot of messaging in Sesame Street in terms of like the community and yeah. like mm -hmm. people from social and stuff like that. And that it could be that, it could be educated. So sure. we're not gonna be able to quite distinguish sure. that. Um I will show you a few things that we can try to do or to be a little bit more of what's going on there. Uh, but yeah, I'm gonna start by showing some electoral participation results because those are kind of the underlying everything that we see. There's this general pattern in the increased participation. I'm then gonna talk about what we see in terms of impact on your choices and preferences, and then uh impacts on ethnicity and inclusive biases. Uh so electoral participation. So like I said, the big thing that you start to see when you look at this data is that um the treated exposed so kids who are right age in places with high coverage compared to slightly older kids in the same area and controlling for generally how people that age are voting, um, you see evidence of increased turnout for these cohorts. So these are all scaled estimates, and I'm scaling them to officially reflect the effect of the 20 percentage point increase in coverage in your town. So 20 percentage points more coverage in your town, you, uh, we're seeing evidence that it's associated with I'm just short of three percentage point increase in validated voting. Um, we see a very similar uh, effect when you look at those self-reported voting behaviors. And it does seem to be kind of these cohorts in particular, you see some kind of discontinuity there for the, the treaty cohorts. Um, and so we see very similar effects whether you look at the actual validated voting versus self-reported voting. We think this is quite important actually to understand our results because you dealt with political surveying, people tend to over report how much they vote. And so if you look at the mean, a lot of people say they vote, but in fact, there's only validated voting records for a much lower share, right? Um, and so there is this issue with these kinds of surveys in terms of kind of people 
pro-social misreporting of voting behavior. Right. Um, what we don't find is we don't see any evidence that Sesame Street impacted the likelihood that you misreport your, or misrepresent your, your voting behavior to the surveyor. So when the surveyor shows up a week after elections, lots of people are in line, but the people who are exposed to the show are not more or less likely to, to lie about it. Yeah, I'm sorry, can you just put the 20 point increase in? I don't know how to think about that. Yeah. What does that mean? So, we just want to think about if, like, your county, like, say they had improved the broadcasting power that your county is picking up, like, how that would have affected. Um, so, is it a measure of intensity of how many households in that get? It's or, like, or is it a measure it's a of like. percentage of households that you think are, are able to pick up the. So, it's not the quality of the signal, it's just the exposure to the signal. Yeah. So, yeah. Because we don't actually know whether kids were watching sure, or not. Right, right, right. I, mean, I, know yeah, I was just trying to think what 20 points, like 20 points yeah. does not have an intuitive yeah, I, I, interpretation. I think it's like the measure of our signal going up by 20 percentage points okay. of coverage. Um, that's, that's, yeah. But coverage has to do with population density. They've got a tower and it's near, it's in a fixed but, yeah, so I think what they so did in the original data is they used the population centroid for the county okay. to figure out that. So, so they're going to figure out in the county where's the average population located and then where's the closest, the best tower that gets you coverage for that specific location and, and just attribute that to the average. And, and sorry, so to put it back, does it vary within the county then? Uh, in reality, yes, but in our data, no. Right, so, so we just okay. assign one number to each. So it also then depends on the geographic coverage of the yeah. county, right, yeah. which is going to vary by state, right? Presumably there's some cut point where, I mean, if, if it's zero to 100, it's like a signal strength. Like yeah. at some point when you're down at 20 or something, it's so very fuzzy. Like, Technically, getting right. right. Well, that's why I was wondering if it was strength, quality, strength, strength yeah. signal, or as opposed to just like actual signal being broadcast, right? Because right. I was starting to think about there's almost got to be like a zero one kind of point where once you're below some number on that continuum, why right. does it will be zero? So, so the way they estimate the, the technology is there's like using Nielsen coverage. So, okay. like Nielsen's decided they. So they, they have information for commercial channels. So to get into the details, they have information for commercial channels from Nielsen, because Nielsen collects that for advertising purposes. So then they use that information and the commercial power specification to figure out the, the relationship between technology and coverage as like when Nielsen takes the place as coverage decision. And then they apply that to the PBS channels, which are that typically are broadcasting Sesame Street, but you don't necessarily have good coverage data because it's not commercial, so they don't have to sell coverage to advertisers. So they have this kind of back way to get at the kind of coverage rate of these GPS channels, which is quite, quite creative. Um, so that, that's what we see for, for, um, for turnout. And so it is important to see that we don't really see any impact on the consistency of your reporting because you might be worried that exposure to the show could come up with stories that it makes people less likely to lie to a surveyor. You could also come up with stories that it makes people want to appear more pro-social, so it's not clear which way it would go. We're not seeing any evidence in the turnout data that it changes people's propensity to misrepresent themselves. We then look at registration, and so um, we see kind of uh, in registration data, we see evidence that uh, the exposed cohorts compared to their elder uh, peers are more likely to be registered to vote and have evidence of active voter registration. Um, we see that they're more likely to report that they're registered to vote. Here we actually see some evidence that there's uh, inconsistency pattern, and so essentially the exposed cohorts are more likely to have to know their voter registration status, right? And this, we think of this as actually being evidence that they're more accurately informed about their registration status, because for the turnout, it's hard to explain why somebody's asking you whether you voted a week ago, um, why you wouldn't know that. So for registration, you can imagine, like, 
I think that really should be like, am I actually you know, you can think of reasons why people might not actually have accurate information about that. Um, so it seems to have reduced uh, these inconsistencies, and so the, the exposed cohort seems to be more accurately or accurately informed about whether or not the rents should be So then we try and like dig into the data a little bit to understand why or where some of these uh, informal participation effects are coming from. Um, we essentially replicate exactly what Trudy and Levine find in both of these data sets, which are different data sets from what they were using. And we find no evidence that Sesame Street impacted years of education, like uh, educational attainment uh, in the long run. Um, in either the IAP data or the CCS data, uh, we don't see the impact on that or on the And so, but not to say that it's not education, it's just the one measure of education that we have, we're not seeing impact on that, right? And this is consistent with what they find. It could be that they, Learn more during those years of school because they were in a grade that was more, you know, they were able to keep up in the early uh, years. Right. Yeah. Sorry? Are you interested? Uh, for, for this, not, not for this, but I will uh, read it. Yeah. Um, so then we look a little bit at um, uh, whether there's <laughs> the educational effects for that, I would actually point you to the Trinity and the Dean paper because they really dig into that. They have better measures of education than what we have. Um, for we then look a little bit at other kind of kind of uh, non political forms of civic engagement. So we have some questions on blood donation, whether people have been in the union, whether they served in the military, and we don't really see any evidence of impact on, on these measures. What we do see is that people seem to have a little bit more knowledge about politics. And so when asked, they are more likely to say that they actively follow public affairs. Um, and uh, when asked about their senators and their U.S. House representatives, so they're asked about three different you know, representatives for uh, their district, um, they actually recognize the names of these people. So they're more likely to say, oh, I recognize this. They're less likely to say that they don't know who, who they're talking about, which is about uh, their representatives. <laughs> So they seem to have a little bit more political knowledge, and when we dig, it seems to be that uh, we see uh, some patterns of essentially kind of slightly increased engagement by marginal voters. And so when we look at when people say that they didn't vote, so the people who admit that they didn't vote, they're asked, well, why? Why did you not vote? Um, they're less likely to say that they didn't like the candidates, less likely to say that they, uh, uh, so, you know, they're less likely to say they didn't vote because they didn't like the candidates because they're not registered because they're not interested. And there's a whole long list of reasons, right? And go from everything from like I think from child care and transportation. Broadly speaking, they're just slightly more willing to incur kind of non pecuniary costs of their decisions. When we look at responses to political ideology. In both data sets that we have, um, the respondents are more likely to say that they identify with the party or with the political ideology, so that's kind of liberal or conservative. So they have a slightly more opinions. And however, when you look at kind of more active engagement in politics, you don't really see any evidence. And so if you ask them, did you ever attend a political meeting? Put up a political sign, worked on a political campaign, made a campaign donation. We don't see any evidence of movement in those indicators for primary voting, which is going to attract right, kind of more engaged voters. We don't see any evidence of turnout effects on primary elections. And so it really seems to have uh, the, the effects seem to be kind of driven by these very kind of low cost. Uh, political behaviors and not so much the kind of higher forms of, of political engagement. Okay. okay, so that's what we have for electoral participation. 
Um, that's in the background of everything that we see. Um, so we so just have to make sure that that's uh, fixed. And then we got into kind of how people report voting um, on the ballots that they fix. And so the first thing that we do is we hone in on ballots that feature a minority candidate running against a white candidate. Um, and so respondents essentially on these ballots, we're going to categorize them into four different categories. You either report that you voted for the minority candidate, for the white candidate, for a third party, or you say that you did not vote. Right? And so on these types of ballots, um, we see the turnout effect. Right? And then we see that uh, the exposed cohorts are much more likely to report that they voted for the minority candidate. Um, and you can see the kind of big discontinuity, right, that the cohorts that would have been more exposed to the show, um, they're more likely to report voting for the minority candidates. And even though there's a turnout effect, they're less likely to report uh, voting for white um, And so this is kind of indicative of there's actually some people that seem to be switching, uh, or that not like the individual switching, but the evidence that the group is switching. <laughs> we look at the same, we do the same thing, essentially looking at uh, female candidates, or women candidates, and we see kind of similar patterns where, again, you see the turnout effect. So less likely to say that they didn't vote, um, and more likely to report that they voted for. And again, you know, and this continuity effect. And so these, these effects are more muted, um, but, but they're there all the And then the question is, are these results caused by a candidate demographic? Because obviously being a minority or woman candidate correlates with a whole bunch of other candidate attributes that um, maybe that's what people are responding to. Um, so then we look at uh, report uh, voting across parties. Um, and so again, we see the turnout effect, right? So people exposed to more are less likely to say that they didn't vote, um, and they're more likely to say that they voted for both Republicans and Democrats. So the gains for Democrats are more. But it depends on the structure of the ballot, because when you focus in specifically, so here we're taking all of the elections and we're kind of splitting them up. I'm going to take here we have ballots that feature two candidates for both of the candidates are white men. Here are the Democrat is a minority candidate, and here the Democrat is a woman candidate. And so when you limit the sample to only ballots that feature two white men, in that sample, you still see the turnout effect, but actually there doesn't seem to be a propensity to vote more Democratic um, who is so forward. If anything, you know, it's all, none of this is statistically significant, but if anything, it's just more question. But when you turn to ballots, on the other hand, where um, the Democratic candidate is either a minority or a woman, there you see, again, the turnout effect and that increased likelihood of voting Democratic. So this increase in voting Democratic for the treaty cohorts is really concentrated in the elections where the Democratic candidate is uh, the better. So, if it's about candidate demographics, well, the party choice seems to be unaffected when there's no diversity on, on the ballot. We then look at, you know, we take elections where the minority candidate, so where the elections where there's a minority candidate running against a white candidate, what does it look like when the minority candidate is a Democrat versus what does it look like when the minority candidate is a Republican? Right. And in both of those scenarios, you see also evidence that the treated cohorts are more likely to report voting for the For the women candidates, um, when the woman is running as a Democrat, uh, you see increased reporting voting for uh, Democratic women. For what happens when the woman is running as a Republican, it's just very noisy. Um, it's kind of a small sample. It's kind of rare to have ballots where the woman, you have a Republican woman running against a white uh, Democrat, male Democrat, right? Male Democrat. Um, so maybe uh, we can't really say much about this, but 
much. So, so then, so you see these effects for minority candidates um, that she to hold no matter what party the minority candidate is running for. We then look a little bit at responses to specific policies. So is this kind of the policy that people are voting for? It's kind of a mixed bag. So to do this, we have to, so the CCS asks a variety of different policy questions depending on whatever year it is and what they're interested in. So we really have to focus on questions that are asked frequently enough so that we're powered. So environmental policies are asked fairly frequently. We don't see any really evidence that there's a change in impact or like that these cohorts are more or less supportive of environmental policies. We do see evidence that the treated cohorts are more likely to support uh, gay marriage. We don't really see any evidence on support for abortion rights. Um, and we see evidence that uh, the treated cohorts seem to be, and this is a little bit unpowered, but it does seem that there seems to be uh, supporting of uh, kind of uh, more restrictive immigration policies. So it's kind of a mixed bag when you look at actual specific policies. Some of them, policies you would kind of associate with kind of more liberal voting, others more conservative, so a little bit. And then similarly, um, when we look at uh, kind of how people identify on the political spectrum, what's clear in both of the data sets that we're looking at is that the treated cohorts are more likely to have an opinion. <laughs> um, they are less likely to say that they're moderate or neutral. And they're more likely to say that they are either conservative or liberal, uh, but it, it, it moves in both directions. And so they, they just seem to have an opinion, but the opinion itself it could be uh, either either kind of direction. So and they just having this is very consistent across the two data sets that we look at. Although uh, this one is just much more basic. So we argue that the balance of evidence suggests that voters are responding to candidate demographics. Um, and we find direct evidence in the implicit bias data that there's a change in the bias. Right. So we then turn to the IAP data. Um, and we look at the IAP data um, from Project Implicit. And we see evidence that for white test takers, the treated cohorts are slowly scoring lower on their IAP test. Uh, it's a small effect, but it's there and it really, you know, seems to be kind of those treated cohorts that are, are not even too low. Um, as you would expect, you see kind of a null on non-white test takers, although the standard is not very large. Um, and we also check for selection in the IAP data, because the IAP data is just, you, anybody can go onto the website and take the test. Um, what we do is we look and see whether in a county, what share of these age groups, what share of test takers are, are coming from the, uh, the treated age groups versus the, the untreated age groups, and does that correlate with this? If, if you're more likely to take the test, you would expect to this higher coverage, you would see more younger uh, test takers. We don't see any evidence of selection uh, on the, the race IEP. Um, kind of consistent with this story, another interesting pattern that we've noticed is that when you look at the voting for minority candidates, the effect is really driven by minority candidates who are not incumbents. And so new kind of new to their district minority candidates. Um, those are the candidates that are driving this effect of this voting. And so we think that this is fairly consistent with. Uh, the idea that implicit biases are going to play a li larger role in the decisions for lesser known uh, minority candidates. We look, uh, there are some questions about uh, racial views and kind of explicit views on race uh, in the data sets that we're working with. And so the CPS asks a few questions about. Uh, whether or not the respondent believes in structural racism, how supportive of they are they of community action, we don't really see much going on there. 
Uh, the IEP also asks some new questions, and again, we don't really see much on whether or not people are supportive of affirmative action, whether or not they believe uh, racial profiling is justified in certain situations. Um, they have a few thermology questions, and these are questions like, how warm do you feel about group X? Um, and you do see that the difference in group form is moving in the direction you would expect, but it's not anywhere near as I think it's just, you know, the reason why people came up with it is very difficult to elicit responses to these types of questions, and we're not seeing anything in these specific kind of uh, issues. So we then look a little bit at the gender and career IAT test scores. We don't see any evidence of impacts on the gender and career IAT test. Now, to be clear, there's a lot fewer respondents on that. So it's like, I think there's like 600,000 in the race IAT and only 100,000 respondents in this data. So we don't see any evidence. But what we do see is we, we see impacts on selection. And so the, um, the younger cohort are more likely to log on and take a gender career IEP. The younger cohorts in the treated areas are more likely to, to take a gender and career IEP test than their affirmative action So, yeah. <laughs> we think that's kind of said something. We don't know exactly what it says, but, but it does seem to be moving something. Um, so at least it seems to have increased interest in this issue. Uh, so, um, to conclude, uh, principal age exposure to child media portrayed the inclusive and egalitarian and diverse America seems to reduce prejudice in the long run with consequential implications for promoter preferences. We see evidence of reduced um, white implicit bias in the black in the long run, increased engagement in the political process, and increased reported voting for minority and So this is the first of a number of ongoing projects that we're going to be looking at, looking at kind of media representation um, and uh, important kind of outcomes. So we're going to be looking at Sesame Street, but also other sources of media representation on presidential choice, kind of social relationships and mental health. Um, and I'm happy to, to discuss this more in the sections. But thank you. Now I think we have a question. <laughs> As an economist, I'm like really weirded out. <laughs> 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 yeah. I just um, I was curious what other forms of media you all were looking at and tried to show. We're gonna look at some sport, some variations in sports, um, using some some randomness to kind of how diverse sports teams are and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. I was just going to ask, did you, um, when you were talking about the question, did you check to see the impact on economic policy, but domestic economic policy? So, challenge with the CCS data is every year they, the survey is a little bit different, and so they always ask questions that are kind of relevant to the voters of the time. And so, like, from 2006 to 2020, there's quite a bit of change in the climate. So we needed to find questions that we thought were like broadly the same question over different years to be able to pull enough responses to get any kind of statistical signal. So I think the economic policies, um, I guess the, the environmental questions are often like pitched as a trade off between kind of economic policies versus. Um, but I think the questions about economic health were usually kind of two years specific to be able to pull the uh, other years question. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I was just wondering, how do you think about, you know, obviously it's a very particular time, yeah. right? You know, so like yeah. Sesame Street was really the only game in town. Yeah. Right? You're not even yeah. like you've had this question before. So um, <laughs> But so you know, how do how do I think about generalizability? Yeah, a little, a little bit. I don't I don't know that you can take that. I mean, I think the way I think of it is like these 
discussions we're having today about increasing representation in the media, I think these are important. I think that's what we say. Now, whether I show you Sesame Street today that doesn't have the same, I don't think yeah. so, because here you have. It's interesting to think about what the counterfactuals of the kids are, because I show this slide, right? And the big question is, is in some ways, what is this, right? <laughs> Uh, are they watching TV? Are they playing outside? I think probably they're not watching TV. We don't actually have good data on what kids are doing. I would love if you know of any data on what kids did with their time in 1959. <laughs> I would love to have that because I would love to think about this. But I, I think today <clears throat> that, that question mark is probably not as bad <laughs> yeah. All right. uh, as, as maybe it was uh, at the time. Right? And so I, I don't think you can take these estimates and apply them to a treatment that would would, would go into place today. Yeah. But I do think it suggests that it's really fast. Yeah, because I mean, it just it's, it's changed in two ways. One yeah. is obviously there's way more options, yeah. right? And then there's just also intensity, yeah. right? So like you, you were exposed to potentially exposed to a lot of stuff yeah. because there weren't a lot, yeah, a lot exactly, of options. Yeah, exactly. So, right. so there's certain about, you know, some things we're probably watching Sesame Street every day for yeah, you know, yeah, a full hour. Yeah. So, so, so maybe I missed it, but did you ever say anything about whether these effects are big or small? Um. So I mean, I think it depends. The the the, the IAD effect seems really small, but it's really hard to then I don't know what the benchmark is. That's that's my question. Because, I think about it. because the there's only a, to my knowledge. So there's a paper by Ileana de la Ferrara, Ferra, sorry, uh, who um, she finds the effect of having an, a, a so it's in South Africa in the South African context the effect of having a black roommate it reduces IT scores by 0. 0.6 standard deviation and that's like living with a roommate the, the following year makes a big success and to my knowledge that's the only like you know. If you know of any other kind of like uh, papers I could use to benchmark this, it would be really useful. Because the fact I find is like very small on the IED test, like 0.01 standard deviation, but it's there. It's just hard to think about something that happened when you were like five, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, on your inclusive bias, you know, you could paddle to it, and then how that would then also transmit to behavior. Um, so, so for the IED stuff, the standard deviation effect is really small, but it seems to be moving things. And I don't really know how to benchmark it against other things. And in terms of the voting stuff, I think the voting for this what I was saying is exactly a pretty long effect on um, what the five percent is. Yeah. Question on the creator's intentions. You yeah. shared that like the, the setting, the theory, um, the characters, everything was really guided towards the intentional audience of uh, black and brown children or marginalized children. And it sounds like the, the audience actually ended up being a lot of white children as well, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, was, was their intention, or do you know whether their intention was with their academic, um, like, with the academic content and the, uh, the pro social content as well? Was the overall intention to try to reduce educational disparities for black and brown children, or was there also an added, you know, known intention to decrease biases for white children? My sense when reading it is it was more focused on the, the first thing you mentioned, okay. and um, that it was targeted, like, it was kind of the only game in town, and so it became very successful amongst everybody, uh, but I, I think they did make a very deliberate attempt to make the show appealing to kids who didn't necessarily see themselves reflected in other contemporaneous TV shows. If you think of the, the media landscape, um, I'm not supposed to say anything bad about the genres, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, it's showing very suburban, you know, and so I think they, they really wanted to make a show that Kids that weren't from the suburban white context could identify with, and so I think that was a very deliberate choice that they were making. Um, but 
And then it was just for people to show But uh, that's my sense from reading what I read about the show. It's interesting. I, I'm asking because it's, it's interesting to look at the intention based on like representation yeah. of a power minority versus um, changing social narratives within a, a power majority. Yeah. And I think a lot of the media work that we see today focuses, it does focus on representation, but a lot of it is, is guided towards reducing implicit biases, reducing explicit biases, um, and addressing, like changing social narratives in the in the power majority as well. So that, this is an interesting concept yeah. to look at in person. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was just such a good show. It ended up happening. I think, I, my guess is they were surprised by this person. Yeah, I know that it's one of the bit, um, but it really was like that kind of jacket. It's kind of continuing back to what you were saying. And it totally, my brother was born in 1967, and my, one of my sisters was born in 1969. And my mom, I just can remember her saying many times how, like, it was the best thing ever that there was like a show and you could like put your kid in front of it and everyone would be like, well, we can't like, oh, Sesame Street almost done and like everyone would watch it. And I think like my kids watched Sesame Street too when they were young, but there was like, we had a DVR, like we had a lot of other opportunities and a lot of yeah. other times of day that they could watch TV if they wanted to. So I do, I do really get the sense that like everyone was watching it if yeah. they were at home with their parents. Yeah, and I think this speaks to like, it was, I don't, it's very time specific in results because uh, like as you, if you start to move into the homework closer to today, they had more options. They had video, you know, a lot of other stuff going on. So this was kind of period. One of the things that struck me was it. At this seems like an effect that emerges from kind of the hidden curriculum that you talked about. Um, but I was also, I, and I think you, I might have misheard what you mentioned as other null effects of civic engagement, like giving blood or things yeah, like I, that. I, yeah, from like, I, that's what I was going to ask is what do you make of, because it seems like it did change pro-social skills in the short term, so you would expect sort of that same. My read on this is that the very subtle effects uh -huh. and that are just giving people, like, when you take somebody who's like maybe not necessarily the most super involved voter, and then you they might be just a little bit more likely to show up to vote and then they are making these kind of, for them, what might be somewhat marginal decisions about who to vote for, for their, like, these aren't presidential, these are like, you know, it's how to represent the big elections, and that it might be just a tough to Which is why we don't see these big effects on kind of more costly forms of voter engagement, right? It's not like they're like suddenly donating lots of money. It really seems to be kind of, and so donating blood, I thought there might be an effect, but it is a bit more involved than like just, you know, showing up to, to vote, right? Yeah. So I think it's like kind of a subtle thing for these indecisions where people are like making you know, somewhat marginal decisions that are like the things people are just there's no people in that group that actually. That's how I it. Just following up on something that you just mentioned, did you look at this same data for presidential elections? I did. Yeah. The challenge with presidential elections is like when it comes to like actually saying something clear, like is it just an Obama effect or is it or is it mm -hmm. that Obama is African American, right? Or is it because Obama has a this wonderful family? It becomes really hard to yeah. just kind of figure out, but you do see an effect for on, on voting for Obama, uh, particularly in the first election. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's just hard to really interpret what that means. Sure. There's a lot of other characteristics yeah. that are you know, correlated with being Obama. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm curious, do you have uh, it? I understand why the design is the way it is, mm -hmm. why things yeah. are reasons. Uh, but like you said, like uh, there's a lot of there was a lot of science going on Sesame yeah. Street, a lot of focus groups, it wasn't yeah. like it was just did the one sixty eight and yeah. stuff. Yeah. So do you have 
do the data exist to look at like number of like fade out effects of Sesame Street or like you know does Sesame Street decline in effectiveness and later like in the 70s versus kids that are getting it right now in the 60s or maybe as they continue to sort of refine how they did it um maybe you do see the facts in some of those other groups of people there were fundamental tenets of Sesame Street that yeah. have always been the same, yeah. but presumably other aspects of the show have yeah. changed based on the market. So, you can possibly imagine, like, so, you